There's no clarity here as to what this really means. Are we eliminating resources? Are we eliminating things? And who is this being eliminated for? There's already a shortage of resources that young black kids get. What so recently I watched a video entitled uh, Black Men Read Project 2025 and give their unfiltered results where they had a professor of UCLA, uh, Professor Dr. Tyrone Howard, break it down, which he didn't break it down. Actually, they just gave biased opinions. Not good. What I'd like to bring to your attention are some of the concerning and disturbing aspects of Project 2025 that we in the Black community should be concerned about. Federal education policy should be limited and ultimately the Federal Department of Education should be eliminated. Outrageous. That's just complete nonsense. There's no clarity here as to what this really means. Are we eliminating resources? Are we eliminating things? And who is this being eliminated for? There's already a shortage of resources that young black kids get. What are we going to do if we don't provide the same education resources for everyone? Okay, so he's already saying that he doesn't have any clarification as to what this really means. So to me, that would suggest that you should do more research to find out what they're trying to say. And he is making this about young black children because he is saying there's already limited resources for young black children, but it does not state that it's doing this just to deprive young black children, is it? I think Project 2025 is something that's gonna set us back about 20 years. Wow. I don't think enough people are educated on just how bad this 2025 thing is. Any discussions around race and racism are now being eliminated, which to me is erasing a core part of our history. Black history is just not black history. It's actual the history. It's the history. It's not just black history, you know, because you can't, you can't go back in history and not find black people. You're trying to erase the history, but you're not willing to necessarily erase the legislation that holds us down on a day-to-day -day basis. Got it. Okay, so here's where I think we should start discussing um, who is responsible for Project 2025, and it is the Heritage Foundation. Quick Google search, or wherever you search, <laughs> we'll tell you that. Um, yeah, so it says the Heritage Foundation is a nonprofit public policy research institute based in Washington, D.C., found in 1973. Heritage's mission is to formulate and promote conservative public policies based on the principles of free enterprise, limited government, individual freedom, traditional American values, and a strong national defense with more than 200,000 individual foundation and corporate supporters. 200,000 guys. Um, Heritage is the most broadly supported public policy research institute in the country and it has a staff of nearly 200 and an annual budget of 38 million you may then go to their website where it says every day the heritage foundation is building an american where freedom opportunity prosperity and civil society flourish Heritage mission is to formulate and promote public policies based upon principles of free enterprise, limited government, and individual freedom. Then it says traditional American values in a strong national defense. Just highlighting some things that I think are important here. It also says, but unlike so many other organizations in Washington, D.C., the Heritage Foundation's focus isn't on putting more power into the hands of government. It is on returning power to the people. That is why we do not work on behalf of any special interest or political party. Instead, our commitment is to the American people and the more than 10 million members, advocates, and concerned Americans who support us, okay? So what that translates to me is that this is not a particular political party. However, it is based upon the interest of a lot of people who are invested. And that's typically what goes down in America. And uh, yeah, so again, guys, I'm going to give you more. But at the end of the day, I surmise that um, it doesn't matter who's going to be in office this thing is going to go. Heritage well-renowned experts 
uh, deeply experienced in business, government, the military, nonprofits, academia, and communications, spend each day developing innovative solutions to the issues American faces. Now, from empowering parents in education, reversing, growing, in and spending, and inflammation, and I'm sorry, <laughs> inflammation, <laughs> well, yeah, inflation, and protecting the unborn to securing America's borders, countering the threat of communist China, holding big tech accountable, and ensuring free and fair elections. Heritage is on the front lines to the fight to help Americans thrive. Our team then takes these solutions directly to the decision makers in the government to turn ideas into action. Heritage has been consistently ranked the number one think tank in the world for it. This is bigger than your Donald Trump or any one particular political party. This is a lot of people who have obviously a lot of influence. They're in a lot of areas and they have a lot of power and they are determined to carry out their agenda, if you will, regardless of who's in office. And I'm pretty sure uh, Kamala knows that. And yes, it is absolutely possible for a political party to present something as bad, horrible, terrible, dangerous, and also try and push the fact that the opposing party is all behind it when they know full well it really doesn't matter who of the two are behind it because it's a go regardless of who's in office. And in my opinion, I believe that that is the case here. So they have heritage training. Would you like to know more about that? Of course, with over a dozen programs led by policy analysts, subject matter experts, and seasoned practitioners, the Heritage Foundation is the leader in training and educational programming for conservatives. When we invest time, professional development, in professional development, we become more effective as individuals and as a movement in advancing our shared ideas and values. Click on the links below to learn more about our offerings and following audiences. I mean, you should do that. You should check them out. It's called research. And here are the some, some of the links. Students and young professionals, Capitol Hill staff, presidential administration appointees, communications professionals, foreign policy professionals, judicial clerks, conservative movement allies, school board members, candidates, and first principles. <laughs> Let's do a brief on these students and young professionals. All right, so the 118th Congress has begun and staff positions are open across the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. These positions represent a unique opportunity for professionals like you to advance conservative principles and impact public policy. Ready, set, heal is here to help you land your first heel job and prepare you for success. Do you understand what that means? It means they're in Congress. <laughs> they place you there intentionally to carry out their purpose. Local University Conservatives Network, LUC, this program is for freshmen and sophomores attending DC area universities. Now, we'll set you up for long-term success in public policy. You'll gain a foundation in conservative thought, cultivate essential career skills, and connect with fellow conservative undergraduates. Now, the Conservative Hill Intern Program is exclusively for interns on Capitol Hill. And you will learn the fundamentals of political philosophy from leading conservative intellectuals and you'll gain practical insights on advancing your career on the Hill and in the public policy sphere. See, this is how they fellowship, y'all. This is how, you know, that thing that um, black folks really don't do anymore. Okay, from classroom to capital, the Heritage Foundation's high school fellowship is for young conservative leaders. As a high school fellow, 
You won't just watch from the sidelines. Oh, no. You'll be immersed in the National Conservative Conversation Participate in Real Life Policy capstone and connect with influential leaders and like-minded students. Are you ready to start your conservative, your conservative leadership journey? Hmm. Training them in high school. Oh, they're targeting black men. Yes. No. See, they're targeting whomever they're targeting. They have goals and agendas and they put their money, their resources, and themselves together and make that happen, okay? And not saying that you would stand a good chance against it, but we don't even try anymore. So, you know, don't holler victim and not acknowledge the things that you don't even try to do anymore. Now they have an internship program and it's designed for rising college juniors. Through recent college graduates, this 12 to 15 week internship pairs practical work experience with educational programming. Now, what does that programming include? Well, opportunities to lead from experts in a variety of fields through policy briefings, mentorship, and a first principles series. Yay. <clears throat> the Academy, N not the Marcus Garvey Frederick Douglas Academy. No, that one is, we just, we're still waiting on it. But, you know, Umar did say that um, he believes that uh, Trump was duped out of the election. <sighs> yeah, he said that. Oh, okay. They, 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 they playing games. They playing games, bro. They are absolutely playing games. You know, Art, when I look at this election, and as I've looked at this election since the last time you and I spoke, which was right after you know Kamala declared she was gonna step in with, with Joe, I believe that the global white power structure wants Kamala. I absolutely do. The democratic agenda is so in alignment with the one world order, everything from the LGBT to the kids to the COVID, you know, all of that is in alignment with what they wanna do. The problem is Donald Trump is so popular. See, Donald Trump is a nationalist art. They don't want a nationalist. They don't want someone who's looking out for the best interests of America. They want someone who's looking out for the best interests of the global elites. And that is the Democrats. The question is, are they willing to cheat Trump out of the election and risk a full scale revolt by poor white America? That's the question. That is the that that is the question. Are we willing to risk a social catastrophe if Donald Trump is cheated out of the election. In my opinion, Art, I believe he's the front runner. Even though they're reporting that Kamala has a slight edge, I'm not buying it. I believe Donald Trump is the front runner. And I believe he won the last election. I believe he beat Joe Biden, but got cheated. And it don't make a difference to me who wins because none of them care about black folks. I want to be clear about that. But I believe he beat, I believe he be he beat Joe Biden. If he gets cheated again, I don't think white America takes this laying down. I cannot see white America taking this laying down if he gets cheated again. The question is, are they willing to risk a civil war, a potential civil war in this country if he's cheated again? <clears throat> so students, young professionals and civic leaders engage in this 12 week online program to learn the foundational principles of American political thought and the important policy debates facing our country and you will grow in your ability to engage more confidentially in policy debates and more meaningfully in your community. Now see, they are teaching and learning how to debate, research, educate themselves and speak knowledgeably about issues. What this guy, uh, Tyrone is it? did not do for you guys here. <laughs> Insane, okay, cool. That's a, that's a wicked game that they're playing. I feel like they're trying to just disintegrate everything and I don't appreciate that. Either. No, this is crazy. This is actually crazy. This is worse than the other one. It's overwhelming. Um, I can't believe someone actually took the time to put together this document that is, it's absurd. It's absurd. But we're not done. So. The program also teaches completed staff work, CSW, 
once a classified military leadership technique. It's a proven method for solving problems, making decisions, and delivering results. Enhance your professional toolkit and get equipped to become the indispensable go-to staff member in your office. Or contact us to invite a heritage expert to speak at your campus event, either in person or virtually. Yeah. See, what I've seen Kamala do is bring um, entertainers to perform, dance, second job, and even speak at her rallies. Mm, okay. Well, ready, set, heal. <laughs> The 118th Congress has begun and staff positions are open across the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. Now, these positions represent a unique opportunity for professionals just like you to advance conservative principles and to impact the public policy. Ready, Set, Heal is here to help you land your first heel job and prepare you for success. So exclusively for interns on Capitol Hill, you learn the fundamentals of political policy from leading conservative intellectuals and gain practical insights on advancing your career on the Hill and in public policy sphere, in the public policy sphere, you know. Yeah, it's just so much stuff. Now the Heritage Congressional Fellowship is a premier educational program for the junior level staffers on Capitol Hill. And it provides a foundation in first principles, public policy issues, staff skills, and congressional procedures. Now, you'll also broaden your network and get to know fellow conservatives that work alongside you on Capitol Hill. Are you guys kind of get, getting it yet? You know, set, they're setting up all of these things to educate and train and, you know, bring you on in. And y'all don't do none of that. I'm just saying. So now we have the George C. Marshall Fellowship, and this is designed for early to mid-career professionals working in national security and foreign policy. And this program provides the opportunity to learn about the development of American Grand Strategy, and you will gain a comprehensive overview of national security principles and learn the firsthand from leaders with years of experience in the field. So easy to just say it's Donald Trump, right? Okay. There's the Civil Society Fellowship. Now, professional heel staff take an in-depth look at how life, marriage, and religious freedom form the foundation of American civil society. Now, there is levels to this. There's levels to this. In addition to learning how to effectively articulate your conservative principles on these vital issues, you'll also network and collaborate with your colleagues in the program and other prominent conservative groups. There's a speech writers fellowship. Yes, learn how to write speeches. Okay, now you graduate. Now you 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 are in the leadership skills for congressional staff position. And this program for mid-level heel staffers prepares you for leadership roles and impart skills to unify and increase the effectiveness of your office. And you'll learn from the best seasoned instructors who've led in government business the nonprofit sector, and in combat. I hope y'all still with me now. Just pay attention because I'm trying to put you up on game. Uh, show you how this all works, okay? You have the Presidential Administration Academy. Now, this is a one-of-a-kind educational and skill-building program designed to prepare and equip future political appointees to be ready on day one 
of the next conservative administration. Now, this training provides aspiring appointees with the insight, background knowledge, and expertise and governance to immediately begin rolling back destructive policy and advancing conservative deals in the federal government. Did you get it yet? So you have an eight-week communication program and you'll dig into the latest communication techniques and you'll apply the concepts directly to your own work and complete the program with a new communication gang. This whole world revolves around gang, pure D gang, I let it octane. And you have this game plan to take your priority issues to the next level. Corrupt ain't lies. You have the Crisis Communication Leadership Training Program. Mm-hmm. Leaving no area unturned. You are going to learn it all from foreign policy. You're going to have judicial clerkship training, conservative movement allies. Okay. You you got crisis communication. We already talked about that one. Man, principles of leadership. And this is for organizational managers. Oh, don't forget, not just the judges, but the school board members as well. All right. And, you know, you got your candidate briefing program. Okay. So, so do you guys yet understand? <laughs> I hope. These are the people who want to see Project 2025 go through. And again, I have no opinions on the policy per se because I have not read it yet. But they are in every aspect. And again, it's not one of your political parties. It doesn't matter who is in office when it concerns Project 2025 because there are so many powerful and influential forces behind this this is what they do baby so it's gonna happen regardless of who you vote for and no donald trump is not responsible these are the things that are getting this done now you can go on their website you can check them out you can see um, basically what they are about um, who all may be involved and what they're trying to implement and what they mean. Now, we all know at the end of the day, this, this don't have you as in a black person's best interest at mind. I don't think they really have you in mind at all. It, it, it's, guys, you don't even try. You don't even try. Then you can go over to Project 2025's website, as I have done, and you can read their entire policy. Now, they have a little layout of what they're trying to do, and I mean, I've checked that out too. Now, let's get to this critical race theory, okay, because this is something that they're wanting to get rid of, and this is all of their website. So from the Heritage, they are saying that critical race theory is an academic discipline founded by law professors who use Marx's analysis to conclude that racial dominance by whites created systematic racism, in quotes. Critical race theorists have been dominant in colleagues and universities for years, but their impact on public policy was limited until recently. The precepts of CRT have now burst outside the universities, affecting K-12 schools, workplaces, state and federal governments, and even the military. Now, this has sparked resistance from Americans who refuse to have their children indoctrinated or to submit to race-based workplace harassment. Now, I cannot make this up, but if ever you guys have an argument, you have one here, and I'm with you. Uh, they want to get rid of this. Now, uh, let, let me 
finish reading. It says, as a new tactic against the grassroots opposition, CRT's defenders now deny that the curricula and training programs in question form a part of CRT, insisting that the diversity, equity, and inclusion programs trainers such as Ibram X. Kindy and, okay, listen, did did they want to get rid of uh, what is called critical race theory? Now, what is critical race theory, though? Now, as I showed you in an earlier screenshot, um, you can find out more about their theory of critical race theory on their website. But eh, as from just what I read, their opinion of it, in my opinion, is um, propaganda-ish and mostly incorrect. But it is saying that a woman named Kimberly Crenshaw is widely cr- accredited. Um, for coining the term critical race theory. And you can pause and read this, or you can go read more about it. Uh, some of the sources say that it was a group of men, da 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 da. Now, here it states that critical race theory has its intellectual roots in the ideas of legal realism scholars in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, <clears throat> earlier than that, okay, such as Oliver Wendell Holmes, Carl Lindwell, and Benjamin N. Cardzo. In 1981, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver W. Holmes wrote the common law, which stated the life of the law has not been logical. Now, you guys can go and check that out. It further states that it's been an experience, the felt necessities of the time, the prevalent moral and political theories, institutions of public policy, avowed or unconscious, even the prejudices which judges share with their fellow men have had a good deal moral to do than the idea of equality before law in determining the rules. Now, critical race theory and critical legal theory appeared within scholarly writing almost simultaneously in the 1970s as critical race theory legal scholars interacted in conferences across the U.S. They welcomed a variety of non-legal influences ranging from Marxist theorist Antonio Gramsci to the recently deceased social and political activists and, you know, Martin and Malcolm. Oh, but I beg of you to consider that critical race theory only came from Dr. Frances Cress Welsing. Are we forgetting about her? Now, to rid of critical race theory is to rid of all of her and those before her and alongside hers hard work. And I do mean hard work is the black presence yesterday and today and although our theme is historical and contemporary this edition will emphasize the present-day issues of afro-americans the special edition will feature two contemporary spokespersons dr francis welsing a well-known psychiatrist whose psychiatric theories and views on a number of topical issues have had a significant impact on afro-americans she is the author of the crest theory of color confrontation and melvin van peebles director and producer of various stage plays and movies he is the author of a newly published book entitled the true american our first guest is Dr. Francis Welsing. Joining me in the questioning is Richard Prince from the Washington Post. Mr. Prince has the first question. Yes, Dr. Welsing, it's been about a year ago since uh, you were dismissed from Howard University. And at the time, I recall you charged that uh, your crest theory, which in brief holds that uh, whites are inferior to blacks because of the lack of melanin, uh, was responsible for that uh, dismissal. And I'm wondering whether you still believe that and what uh, proof you have of that. Uh, well, Dick, I do believe it. Um... I was dismissed from Howard, fired from Howard in June 1975. In November 1974, um, while still at Howard, I heard a rumor that I was going to be blocked from promotion and tenure because of my views, not because of my uh, academic work. And I went immediately to the dean of the College of Medicine, uh, Dr. Marion Mann, and I asked him, uh, I said, Dr. Mann, I hear that I am going to be blocked from promotion and tenure because of my views. And Dr. Mann uh, responded, to be frank with you, Dr. Welsing, this paper that you wrote, and I said, the Crest Theory of Color Confrontation, he said yes. He went on to say that it did not make sense for me to say that 
white people were envious of black people because white people lack skin pigmentation. And we went on from that point. But let me make one correction. My theory does not say that whites are inferior to blacks. I don't say that. I say that whites feel that they are inferior because they cannot produce skin pigmentation and because their status as, I say, a variant of albinism is genetic recessive to blacks and they can be genetically annihilated by non-white people, that this is what causes that sense of inadequacy, that they have built a total behavioral system that is a compensation. White supremacy is a compensation for a sense of white genetic inadequacy. I see. Uh, one other uh, follow-up on that, and that is, uh, what uh, uh, background in genetics do you have to, to uh, enable you to, to document that theory? Well, I'm a medical doctor, mm -hmm. and all medical doctors receive or uh, take courses in genetics. And this is very, very basic genetics. Mm -hmm. And it not only is very basic genetics, this is common lay knowledge. And we hear it, the dominance, the genetic dominance of black over white is heard in the expression, one drop of black blood makes you black. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you were to relate to a white female, the product of that relationship would be an individual that is identifiable as what is called non-white. They would have something, I mean, the curliness of the hair, the darkness of the skin would make the child look more like you than like the mother. I see. <clears throat> Dr. Welsing, your theory to me seems to infer some innate behavior on the part of a human being because they are, quote, black or white. Would you agree or disagree that the terms black and white are not genetic definitions? And if they are not genetic definitions, then how could your theory be true? Well, wait a minute, when you say genetic definitions, I'm not quite sure what you say, but for the sake of time, the factors that determine whether we're going to have skin pigmentation or whether we lack skin pigmentation is based on genes. In other words, you have genes that determine the quantity of melanin pigment that is going to be produced in your skin, in your eyes, in your hair. If you have a gene, a mutation, uh, towards an inability to produce that pigment, that is also genetically determined. And that is at least within the context of uh, Western, the Western world or the white supremacy culture. The dominant classification of people, not as determined by Francis Welsing, but as determined by white people themselves, is your classification either you are white or you are classified as non-white. This is on your birth certificate, this is on every paper of identification that you have. And this focus on skin coloration, I maintain, is based on the awareness on the people who are now in power, that they are a minority. The white group represents a minority in the world population. And the color focus is something that is a psychological, I say a psychological necessity based on a genetic reality. So I don't know uh, if this gets to your question. Now, any other thing that one might say that results from the absence of pigment, I mean, that's another discussion. I don't know whether you want to go into well, that. Well, following that logic, then, would it not be accurate to say that there would be a difference psychologically in light-skinned blacks from dark-skinned blacks? Well, psychologically, yes, and I think that uh, we are all aware of that. Under white supremacy, the conditioning has been the closer you are to white, the more acceptable you are. So that, for example, all of us learned as we were growing up in the black community, if you are black, stay back. If you are brown, stick around. If you are yellow, you're mellow. And if you're white, you're right. And your, the appreciation of an individual, even within the black group itself, was very often based on the relative absence of skin pigmentation, and even within families. Children thought that they were ugly if they were darker. And families, parents have said that to children, even now. People want to know the first, when a baby is just born in the hospital, some of the first questions that are asked by the black parents about the child or the black family members, is it light skin and does it have straight hair? To know how much value we're going to put on this new baby. Because within the framework of the culture in which we live, the closer you are to white, the more you're considered beautiful, and perhaps an, under some circumstances, the more opportunities you will have. Well, Dr. Welsing, if it is true that uh, you were dismissed from Howard because of uh, your, your uh, views on, on that subject, what would you say then of the, application, uh, the implications for academic freedom at Howard University? Well, I say that, first of all, Howard University is a black university in name only. In other words, those who fund an institution within the framework of a political system, those who fund an institution determine what is going to be done within the framework of that institution. Well, I say that, first of all, Howard University is a black university in name only. In other words, those who fund an institution within the framework of a political system, those who fund an institution determine what is going to be done within the framework of that institution. And so although Howard University is referred to as a black university and the majority of the student body is black and the majority of the faculty is black, still it is possible, I say it is possible, that those people who control the purse strings can say we do not like 
such and such an ideology or philosophy that is coming out of this center. If this continues to come out, then we will not give you funds for building and we will not give you funds to continue the functioning of your center. Now you make your choice. Well, are you saying that this happened in your case or was it simply the case of one dean saying this to you? I mean, Well, let's put it this way. I can, I can only suspect that it happened if you ask me mm -hmm. to prove it. Because I will say that the same funding forces or mm -hmm. sources, if they say, well, we like very much what Dr. Welsing is doing. First of all, no one has been able to disprove what she's saying that we think this is very interesting. I mean, whether the theory is correct or any incorrect, it's a valuable idea to discuss, or it is being discussed a lot. We're glad to have that uh, debate going on in an academic institution. We think that that individual ought to stay there. Then that individual would be there. What about the Board of Trustees and the President of the University? What have they said about the, what happened to you? Well, the Board of Trustees and the President of the University concurred uh, in the decision to dismiss me, despite the fact that the chairman of my department and the executive committee of my department recommended that I be promoted and given tenure. Also, the Committee on Appointments and Promotions within the College of Medicine also recommended that I be promoted and given tenure. So what, what, what do you do now, then? What is your next step? Well, right now, we have been involved in uh, several grievance committee hearings, and I have a lawyer, and uh, the university has a lawyer, so I don't know what the outcome of it is going to be. But my charge is that my, I was removed from the university as a breach of my academic freedom because the discussion centered around the paper that I wrote and that someone disagreed, namely the dean. I mean, he's the one who made the statement to me that he disagreed with the content of the theory. Although I told him I had many documents, I have many, many letters from white people in this area of the world and in foreign countries who have written to me and said, yes, I have always wished that I had more melanin. And I said that to the dean. I don't ask black people what white people think about themselves. I ask white people, or they will tell me what they think about themselves. And anybody who watches the phenomena of sun tanning, millions and millions and millions and millions of white people, the minute the sun is out, lying in the sun, taking the chance of getting skin cancer, to get dark, cannot tell me that white people are satisfied with the way that they look. Dr. Welsing, <clears throat> you've charged, uh, uh, in a sense, that the climate of academic freedom at Howard University is threatened. The Washington Post has said in an editorial, that the leadership of Howard University was wavering. Therefore, therefore, it was not stable, and Howard really didn't have a definite sense of mission. Now, do you feel, in the context of those two statements, that the era of academic freedom or the climate of academic freedom at Howard includes whites who teach there, or do you feel it's basically relegated to the blacks who have theories, quote, that might be controversial or unacceptable? Well, Tony, I don't want to get off into comparing whether it applies to whites or whether it applies to blacks, you know, whether whites can say what they want in Howard and whether blacks cannot. I will simply say, and I don't really, I, I honestly do not fault the leadership at Howard University with any certain sense. In other words, we are an oppressed people in a power system that I maintain supports white domination. If you are going to work and function within that context, you have to go by the rules that have been set up. Now, this may not have anything to do with truth. It may not have anything to do with justice. It may not have anything to do with reality. But I say that the pressure is there on the leadership in so-called black institutions, we might even say as far as television programs are concerned. If you are going to say the wrong thing that makes the people who control the purse strings unhappy, then chances are that you are not going to have that opportunity very long. If what you are saying is conceived of as a threat to the status quo, or if what is being taught or what is being propagated in some way will change the minds of the listeners so that people begin to behave in a different way because they begin to think of things in a different perspective or from a different angle. Well, my question... Uh